So for me, as you probably have already recognized, one of the most exciting aspects of this course is the connections we can make between molecular properties and how those feed into a partition function to give us thermodynamic properties. So I want to study that, again, more closely. And in particular, let's begin not with the Gibbs free energy that we've been working with up till now, but the Helmholtz free energy. And let's look at the chemical potential for the Helmholtz free energy. So just as we did with the Gibbs free energy, we can take the total differential of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to the moles of substance and its natural variables. So the variables for Helmholtz free energy are temperature and volume. So here's the expansion then, temperature term, volume term, number of moles. Of course, these uh, partial derivatives within those natural variables, we choose those variables because they are well-known thermodynamic quantities. So we get the entropy for the first term and the pressure for the second term. Now, if I remember that the Gibbs free energy is equal to the Helmholtz free energy plus PV, I can determine dG as dA plus dPV. Well, I've got dA right up here. So here I'll, I'll reproduce dA. And then d of this product is PdV plus VdP. I've got a negative and a positive PdV, so those cancel one another out. I'll trans transfer what's left to this next slide. And then I'll remind you that when we do a direct expansion of the Gibbs free energy, so here it is with respect to temperature, with respect to pressure, with respect to uh, number of moles, put back in these thermodynamic quantities. So evidently, this term here is the chemical potential, right? This partial free energy of the Gibbs free energy with respect to number of moles, chemical potential, is equal to the partial derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to number of moles. So as long as we're holding the respective natural variables constant, temperature and volume in the case of Helmholtz, temperature and pressure in the case of Gibbs, the two chemical potentials are equal to one another. Why do we care? What makes the Helmholtz free energy so useful? Well, it's because the Helmholtz free energy lets us get to the partition function. So remember that the equations for the internal energy, U, and the entropy, S, as functions of the partition function are shown here. So Internal energy depends on the partial derivative of the log of the partition function with respect to temperature. And remember that entropy depends not only on that kind of a partial derivative, but also directly on the log of the partition function. Recalling that A, the Helmholtz free energy, is equal to U minus Ts, if I do that, if I multiply this times T and subtract it from U, you see, this first term is going to cancel this term. I'll get a kT squared, partial blah, blah, blah. That goes away. And I'm left with minus kT log Q. So that is a very direct way to get at the chemical potential from the partition function. Because the chemical potential is the partial derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to the number of moles of substance. So what I need to do is understand how the partition function depends on the number of moles of substance. And of course I can do it for particles too, but moles, particles, just different units. Let's work then with those potentials and that relationship. So here you see that the chemical potential is equal to either partial derivative of a free energy with respect to holding its natural variables constant. I'm now going to insert for A the expression minus kT log Q. kT comes out, those are just constants, so I'm interested in partial log of the system partition function with respect to number of moles of substance. If I want to work with particles instead, well the number of moles is the number of particles divided by Avogadro's number, so there will be a Avogadro's number in the denominator here, and when I uh, flip it out as a number into the front, it'll multiply Boltzmann's constant. I'll get the universal gas constant. And now recall that the system partition function for a gas is the product of all the molecular partition functions 
And if there are n particles, that means taking the molecular partition function to the nth power, divided by n factorial because of the indistinguishability of particles. So the logarithm of the system partition function then, if I take the log of this quantity and I play the usual games with logs of powers and logs of quotients and the like, I'll get n log q for what's in the numerator and applying Stirling's approximation for the log of n factorial, I'll get minus n log n plus n. And so now in order to get chemical potential, I need to differentiate this partial of log q with respect to the number of particles. So when I do that, it's pretty straightforward. n log q differentiated with respect to n will give me a log q. n log n, that's a product, so I'll get two terms. I'll get a minus log n, and then I'll get an n, and the differential of log n is 1 over n. So minus n over n is minus 1. And finally, this one's about as easy as a differential gets, 1. So these terms cancel each other out. I get minus RT log. I'll express this difference as a ratio. The chemical potential is minus RT log of the molecular partition function. So I've managed to get it all the way down to the molecule divided by number of particles. So I can work with that a little bit further. So right now I've expressed the chemical potential, excuse me, the partition function as a function of volume and temperature as it is. Remember that there's a standard state volume we use when we compile partition functions. And also, remember that it's linear. So if I want to get the volume out of the partition function and express it as Q of T, I could divide by volume. And of course, I, I will multiply by volume, so all I've done is multiplied by 1 within this logarithm. For an ideal gas, I know what volume divided by number of particles is. The ideal gas equation of state says that it's kT divided by the pressure. And now I'll actually pull that pressure out. Uh, there's a negative sign out front. This is in the denominator. I'll end up with a positive sign. And so I get this expression, that the chemical potential is this somewhat more complicated first term, plus RT log the pressure. And to continue manipulating this a bit to a form that we've seen before, what I want to do is add zero. That is, I'm going to add minus RT log some standard state pressure, one bar, for instance. So minus that plus that. But I'm going to move those two terms into different places. So the minus RT log P0, I'm going to put it in this term. So the P0 appears in the denominator here. The plus RT log P0, I'm going to send that one over here. And since that was originally negative, again, it appears in the denominator here. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm now going to compress this entire thing into, it's a number, it's a number that depends on temperature, and I'll call that the standard state chemical potential. That is the chemical potential of the substance at whatever the standard state pressure is, P superscript little circle. Meanwhile, on the other side here, I've got this RT log P over P little circle, and that's why chemical potential more generally, not the standard state chemical potential, depends on temperature and pressure. And that should look exactly like something we saw before for the molar free energy, namely that the molar free energy as a function of temperature and pressure is equal to the molar, the standard state free energy and you don't have to put a bar over it because the standard state implies one mole, plus RT log pressure. All right, and the reason we usually only write P here is if we're working with a standard state pressure that has magnitude one, like one bar, for example, well, then you know, one is a number that divides right into all the, to the, your actual pressure so that you would just get the magnitude of P. So if you like, it cancels the units by walking around as one bar, and it means you have to use pressure in units of bar. That's what standard states are. But why is this interesting? Well, the chemical potential is more general as a quantity than is the pure substance free energy. We're going to look at mixing substances soon, and chemical potentials will continue to be important quantities. And so the other really important thing here is this was derived for the gas phase. So I have a way to compute my chemical potential in the gas phase from the molecular properties of gas phase molecules that I can measure 
And you may remember those will be things like the moment of inertia of the molecule, the vibrational frequencies, the molecular weight. But when I have phases in equilibrium, solid, liquid, if they're in equilibrium, I know they have the same chemical potential as the gas does. And so instead of worrying about how I might have to work with a partition function of a liquid or a solid, I don't have to. I just have to work when it's in equilibrium with its gas and know what the gas's chemical potential is. And here's a great expression that lets me compute that very easily from the standard state uh, quantity and knowing how the pressure has changed relative to that standard state quantity. All right, so I don't know, my excitement might have shot through on that. Uh, we're going to have a chance to exploit that a great deal more in the future. Uh, but that future will be mostly module 10. Instead, this next video, we're going to go over what I think are the most important highlights from module 9. And then we will move on to module 10.